Take your Bible this morning and turn with me to the book of Proverbs and the 16th chapter. Proverbs chapter 16. While you're turning there, if you can listen and turn at the same time, I'm going to ask you a question this morning. How many of you would be willing to raise your hand and say that you have a problem with pride? Would you raise your hand? Amen. Now, to those of you who raised your hand, I'm preaching to you today. But I'm especially preaching to those who did not raise their hand. Amen? <laughs> because they are too proud to raise their hand. Today we're going to talk about the perils of pride. Look in Proverbs chapter 16 and look at verse 18 with me. Proverbs says, Pride goeth before destruction, and a haughty spirit, a proud spirit, before a fall. Amen? Amen? Pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. How many have lived that out? You think, man, I, I got this down. I remember the very first sermon I ever preached. It was on July 6, 2003. And I got up to preach. I preached from Acts chapter 9 about the conversion of Saul. And I want to tell you something. I was nervous. I was 23 years old. And I was getting ready to preach my first sermon. I spent a lot of time reading those scriptures. And I sent that sermon to heaven and back about ten times. God kept sending it back saying, write a better sermon, son. But I, I'd send it up there. He'd send it back to me. And I got ready to preach a little country church. The only thing out there is, was peanut fields and a cemetery. <clears throat> That's where my dad and my brother are. A little bitty country church. That night, nearly a hundred people showed up. <clears throat> my wife's family was there. My dad was there. And my family was there. My dad took off from his church to come down and hear me preach my first sermon. And people poured in there to hear me preach. And I preached, and I got up, and I preached by the power of God's Spirit. And man, I mean, my, my main focus was just get up the stairs without tripping and, and just, just do the best you can, uh, try to slow down and think. And, and I preached, and God, man, God blessed that message. And in a church, I'm serious, in a church where people almost never move, and come to the altar. The altar's filled up. And I, it was such a great night. My dad was the second person down the aisle. The first person down the aisle was my wife, uh, who, who thought that I was only preaching because I wanted to be like my dad. And that was not the case. And we had a big fight about me surrendering to the ministry, and she came down. It was powerful. It was a powerful service. And what happened in that moment, I became kind of proud of myself. And so I got to preach again about two or three weeks later. Didn't study as much. Didn't send that sermon to heaven because if I had, God would have said, no, no, no. And I got up quite proud of myself. I, I know what I'm doing. And the Bible says, pride cometh before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Man, I started to sweat. The notes on my pages turned to hieroglyphics. I couldn't even read them. It made no sense. No sense at all. It was horrible. I've lived that passage out. And many people have. Uh, pride. I, I, I was down in my back uh, back in February, January, February. It was a very extensive time. It seemed like a lifetime. But my wife came to me one day. And she said, you ever think maybe that God is tricking you down because of your pride? See, with help like that. She said, maybe you're just too proud, and God is, is taking you down a notch. But while I was down, I got to watch the Andy Griffith Marathon. And uh, life was good in that respect, other than the excruciating pain that I was in. But um, I was watching the Andy Griffith show, and there was a lady on there. Her name was Abigail Sibley. And, um, and she was a poor widow woman. And she was sad, and Everybody thought, oh, little Abigail, she's just a poor widow woman, had a funeral, buried her husband and all this stuff. And then one day her husband showed up in Mayberry. Much to everybody's surprise. And, and Andy was surprised and, and thought, uh, well, we thought you were dead. As it turned out, he wasn't dead. She'd had a funeral, buried a casket, and had buried her husband as far as everybody else was concerned. All it was was that he had left her. And she was too proud to admit that her husband had left. She, instead, she just had a funeral and buried the man. Amen? That's where a lot of people are. 
in pride. And pride is a, it's a, very, it's a very tricky thing. And you say, well, I don't have a problem with pride. Well, now you do. See how slippery that is? Some people are proud of their humility. Let me, let me give you an example. Let me give you an example. You don't have to turn there, but let me, let me share with you from Luke chapter 18 and a story, a parable about the Pharisee and the publican. It says two men, in verse 10, Luke 18, 10, you can write that down. It'll be right there. Look at that. Two men went up into the temple to pray. The one a Pharisee. Now, we know the Pharisees were the religious gurus of their day, right? They, they're the guys that had it all figured out. And the other was a publican, which he was hated. He was a tax collector, and people hated publicans. One was a Pharisee, one was a publican. Make sure I got that marked there. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men. Woo! That's a high prayer, isn't it? I, 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 uh, I, I fast twice in the week. I tithe of all my possessions, and uh, I do all of these things. I thank you that I'm not like other men. And then the Bible says about the other man, the publican, that he stood, and he wouldn't even look and lift his eyes up to heaven. But he smote himself on the breast, and he said, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Now, there was a Sunday school teacher who taught that lesson to her children in her Sunday school class, and she did a very good job of teaching that lesson. And when she got done, she said, Children, aren't we glad that we're not like that old Pharisee? Oh, it's starting to sink in now. Okay. See how slippery... Pride is how... See, pride is not only dangerous, it's deceitful. It slides in. And we're, oftentimes, we're proud of our humility. Aren't we glad we're not like that man? Woo! Boy, it's a slippery slope. And we got to be careful. That's, you know, Brother West, he looked at my, my notes and he said, so you think we have a problem with pride? I said, well, I know this. I know Brother Matt does. And I'm going to preach to Brother Matt today. And anybody else who raised their hand and did not raise their hand today, I'm preaching to you too. Amen? Amen? First of all, let's talk about what pride is not. Now, this is not in your notes. This is just what we're doing. Pride is not having a good self-image, friends. It's okay to have a healthy self-image. I'm not talking about conceit. Don't be conceited. You know, conceit is the only disease that makes everyone around us sick except for the person who has it. Amen? A healthy self-image. Now, some people are hung up on the idea that I'm just an old sinner saved by grace. Now, that's technically true. But that's not the Bible's description of who you are. You are a born-again, blood-bought, royal, blue blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. You are joint heirs with Christ. You're a friend of God. You're a child of the King. That's the Bible's description of you. Now, I'm going to take a page from Mark Lowry's book. Take your thumb. Hold your thumb up and look at it. Everybody get your thumb up. Get your thumb up, Jerry. Look at it. I know you can't see it. Let me hold your thumb up here so you can see it. <laughs> uh -huh. Oh, there, I can see it now. You see that? You see that imprint on there? That's a one-of-a-kind, unique masterpiece. There's not another one like it in the whole world. You know what that means? That means that you are a thumb body. All right? In Jesus Christ, you are a thumb body. We're not just old sinners saved by grace. So pride is not having a good self-image. You're a child of the king. Friends, you ought to be excited about that. You are somebody in Jesus Christ. Now, pride is not taking pride in a job well done. If you have a job to do, you ought to do a good job. Amen. You ought to give, hey, listen, someone pastors your church for 29 years, you ought to give recognition to that. You can be proud of accomplishments. You can be proud. And if you're doing a job, you ought to do it as unto the Lord and not unto me. And do it right. Take pride in your work. You know, I, I, my son and I mow yards together. We don't always do a good job. And some of you know that because I mow your yard. But I tell Jake, I'm like, Jake, we want straight lines, man. Straight lines. We want the curb to be clean and, and slick. Take pride in what you do. Don't just go out there and do it halfway. That, that's not the pride we're talking about. Taking pride in your labor is not what we're talking about. 
Let's talk about what pride is in reality, though, and what it really is. Pride is an attitude of independence from God. Did you get that? Now, these are not in your notes as well. This is just, this is all extra stuff I'm giving you for free. Pride is an attitude of independence from God. Let me ask you this. How's your prayer life? Do you pray? If your prayer life is anemic, it isn't your prayer life that's the problem. It's your pride that's the problem. Because my pride says, I don't need to pray. Why do I need to pray? Everything is good. I'm doing just fine. I can, I can handle this myself. It's an attitude of independence apart from God. You don't think that you need to pray. Pride is a spirit of ungratefulness toward God. Boy, is that an epidemic in the Christian ranks. Pride is when we refuse to recognize that everything that we have comes from God. Paul asked this penetrating question. He said, what hast thou that thou didst not receive? And if you received it, why do you glory as if you have not received it? Friends, what do we have that we haven't received from God? You say, well, I laced up my boots and I went to work. Yes, by the power and the strength of God Almighty, you did. He gave you the breath in your lungs, and you know this is true. What do you have that you haven't received of God? So pride is an attitude of ungratefulness, a spirit of ungratefulness toward God. Pride is esteeming ourselves better than other people. Esteeming myself better than you. We ever do that? Lord, I thank you that I'm not like other men. We do it. Hey, listen, we probably do it more than we know. And we, we probably do it more than we're too proud to admit, right? So here's a little test to see if you struggle with pride. So far, some of you are going, I'm, I'm good. I've got this. It's not a problem. <laughs> Nailed it. Yeah, <laughs> Nailed it. Some of you are going, failed it. Uh, here's, here's a little test. Number one, this is not in your notes either. We're still not there yet. A proud person gets angry when he or she is corrected. You ever been corrected? Right or wrong or indifferent? What was your spirit like when someone corrected you? A proud person gets angry. Number two, a proud person refuses to admit mistakes. Whew, that one hurts, doesn't it? Some of you this morning said, Brother Matt, you preaching? I said, yeah. You said, well, I'm really excited about hearing it. I said, you remember that you said that. <laughs> and about, about 11.30, you remember that you said, oh, I'm so excited about listening to you preach today. A proud person refuses to admit mistakes. Amen. If you cannot say, I failed, I did wrong, friends, you're struggling with pride. Number three, a proud person will accept, thing, will accept praise for things over which they have no control. Beauty, talent, gifts. You know, if someone gets up here and sings a beautiful, beautiful song with a beautiful, God-gifted voice, and we praise you, and you go, yeah, thank you. I did that. That's pride. You have no control over that. God gifted you with something. Yeah, You didn't get that. Hey, I didn't do this. God made me this pretty. You know what I'm saying? This is God's fault. Don't be, don't be jealous. Actually, my, I won't tell you what my wife said about my face yesterday, just yesterday. But it had something to do with the goat that's growing off my chin. A proud person accepts praise for that which they have no control over. You ever notice that when you come out and I actually preach a good sermon, I try to do this almost every time. Someone say, that was a great sermon, Brother Matt. I almost always try to say, praise God. Praise God. Because the, per, the praise has to be deferred to God. Amen. It's not for me. Listen, I can't stand here and do anything apart from the power and the grace of God. Amen. So if it was good, praise God. Amen. Now, I don't, I don't tire of hearing that, so if you want to tell me that, it's fine. We'll just defer the praise to God. A proud person refuses to take counsel. When I first came here, Brother West took me out on visitation, soul winning, I was zeal without knowledge. And I would back people in the corner, and I'd be barking at them like a watchdog instead of sharing Jesus with them as a friend. Brother West took me aside. He said, can you take constructive criticism? I said, yes. He said, are you sure? 
Because people will say they can, and then you give it, and a proud person can't take counsel. And he shared some things with me that would help my soul winning. And I have to, I have to sacrifice my pride in order to accept those things. The Bible says in Proverbs 1.5, A wise man will hear and increase in learning, and a man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsel. So let's look. Are you, are you struggling with pride? Have I, have I struck a nerve anywhere? Let's talk today about five ways that pride can destroy your life. The five perils of pride. We're going to be bouncing around the Proverbs a little bit, but uh, I got them all here, and they'll be all there. And so you just hang with me and jot them down as we go. Number one, we're finally to your outline. Pride defies God. Pride defies God. Proverbs chapter 6, and look at uh, verse 16 through 19. Proverbs chapter 6, look at this. Verse 16, these six things doth, God, doth the Lord hate, yea, even seven, and are an abomination unto him. A proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that deviseth wicked imaginations, feet that are swift in running to mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among the brethren. Seven things doth God hate, and number one on God's hate parade is pride. A proud look. He hates pride because pride defies God. It flies in the face of who he is. It is pride that created the devil, friends. Pride created the devil. It is pride that took Lucifer, the son of the morning, and made him Satan, the father of the night. When you go into the book of Isaiah, you read here some things about the fall of Satan. I want to read this to you, and I want you to notice the word I. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, the son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which did weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will set also on the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the cloud. I will be like the most high. Yet... Thou shalt be brought down to hell, to the sides of the pit. You see it? It is pride that made Lucifer Satan. It created the devil. Pride created the devil. And friends, it is the, it is the, reigning, it is the reigning supreme ideology in his kingdom, friends, is pride. He wants to plant it in your heart. I will be like the most. Satan's entire kingdom is predicated on your pride and his pride. Pride ruined the human race. It ruined the human race. Listen, when, when, <clears throat> when Adam and Eve were in the garden and Eve was tempted of Satan to eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, was the temptation to try a fruit that she had never tried? Was that the temptation? No. And the Bible said it was good to look upon. It was good for food. The temptation was that she could become like God, knowing good from evil. The temptation was pride. The Bible calls it the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. That's what she faced there in the garden. That is the entire, that is the entire backbone of Satan's kingdom is our pride. And when he said, Yea, hath God said that you shall surely die? You shall not die. But God knows in the moment that you eat thereof, you will be like God, knowing good from evil. He played to her pride. Boy, it defies God. Now, it flies in the face. The reason it defies God is because it flies in the face of all that God is about. 1 Peter, 1, uh, 1 Peter 5, 5 says this, For God resisteth the proud and giveth grace unto the humble. Now, I want you to know something about that verse. It isn't that God moderately opposes my pride. It really means that God stands in battle and pushes back my pride, friends. It isn't that God goes, I don't care for your pride. It's actually that when my pride wells up, God comes in battle against my pride and he pushes it back. But when I come in humility, God giveth grace to the humble, friends. It defies God. 
Number two, pride defiles man. Look at Proverbs 16 in verse 5. It says, everyone that is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Man, that's, that's kind of hard to swallow, isn't it? Everyone that is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. You know what? Oftentimes, we're proud of our sin. We're proud of our sin. And, and people don't want to hear that sin's an abomination to God. They don't want to hear that. Yet he says, even my proud heart makes me an abomination to God. Proverbs 21, 4 says, A high look and a proud heart and the plowing of the wicked is sin. A proud heart, friends, it's sin against God. It defiles man. There's that proud heart again, friends. How did it get there? How did my proud heart get there? It was born there. When, when Eve and Adam fell in the garden. And sin, the Bible says, sin came by one man, Adam. And death, and, and death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. When he did that, see, Adam let a few billion people down. Amen? Because I was born with that pride in my heart. And I heard this illustration. It's old, and you probably heard it too, but it's kind of like the apple and the worm. When you see a wormhole in your apple, you know the only thing worse than finding a, a worm in your apple? Finding half a worm in your apple. Because you already ate the other half. Yeah, you already ate the other half. When you see that wormhole in your apple, know this, that the worm did not bore into the apple. He was born inside the apple and bored his way out. See, what happens is the egg was laid in the blossom. He was born inside the apple, and he bored his way out. You see, that's what happens with our pride and our sin. We were born with that in us. And what happens is it works its way out. That proud heart, it'll work its way out. That sin in our life will work its way out of our life. It'll come out. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Friends, that wickedness, that, that evil heart, it defies God. It defiles man. I want you to look at this. You don't have to look there because they'll turn it to you there for you on the screen. But Mark chapter 7. Mark chapter 7, verse 21. Mark 7, 21 says this, For, for from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts and adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, and wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile the man. Do you see that? It all comes from within us. Why does God hate pride? Because it defies Him. And why is it so destructive? What are the perils of pride? It defiles man. It makes us an abomination to God. We have to crucify our pride. We have to mortify our members, all those things. That's why Paul said we have to die daily. I have to, listen, in order for me to live in this society and please God, I have to die to myself. And that's a hard concept, but listen, friends, it's, it's necessary. Last week, I had one of my favorite people in the whole world came around the corner in the, in the kitchen. It was Sunday morning. I was exhausted. She came around the corner. She goes, whoa, you look tired. I said, thank you. I said, I am tired. She said, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I shouldn't have said that. That was so rude of me to say that. I said, listen, sister, you didn't hurt my feelings. I told her what I've always said that I stole from somebody else, Brother Lester Roloff. If you hurt me, it's not your fault, it's mine. Because I'm supposed to be dead, and you can't hurt something that's dead. Amen? We're supposed to die. Crucify that pride. Listen, I'm not too proud to be insulted. And then listen, anybody who says as, as many offensive things as I do can't be offended when someone says something offensive to you. Amen? You can't be so soft. All right? I've offended more people in one day than anybody else will in a lifetime. So, it defies God. It defiles man. Number three. Pride is destructive because it divides society. Pride divides society. Let's face it, pride is very divisive in all of our lives. Look at this. Proverbs 13.10 says this, and you can jot these down in your little lines there and go back and look at them, but it'll show up here. Proverbs 13.10. 
Only by pride cometh contentions. You know what contentions are? That's what you and your wife had the other day. That's a contention. It's a fight. It's, a, it's an argument. Proverbs 28, 25 says, He that is of a proud heart stirreth up strife. A proud heart stirs up battles. Listen, there's not one battle, not one war, not one church split, not one divorce. That pride did not play a major factor in all of it, friends. Pride. Pride destroys and divides. Listen, if our church gets divided, it's because of pride. If your marriage gets divided, you can count on it. It's pride at the root of it all. If our countries are divided, it's pride at the root of it all. Always. It divides society. And here's why. Pride defies God, and therefore... When it defies God, it puts us out of fellowship with God. Now, you think about this for just a moment. Pride defies God, and so when I am lifted up in pride, it puts me out of fellowship with God. Now, I want to, I want to share something with you that I, I, I got from my father years and years ago, and I don't think I'll ever forget it. When I am out of fellowship, and you listen fast here, listen good. When I am out of fellowship with God, Inevitably, I will eventually be out of fellowship with nearly everyone around me. That's a fact. You write that down hard and fast. When I'm out of fellowship with God, the next thing I know, I'm out of fellowship with my wife. Next thing I know, I'm out of fellowship with my brethren, my co-workers. I'm out of fellowship with people on the job and other places. My fellowship with God is important. And when pride comes in to my heart, and defies God, it defiles me, and it divides me from God, and therefore it divides me from everyone else. Now you say, well, I'm having some trouble in my life right now, in my marriage, in my home. You go back and check your relationship with God and check your pride status. Anybody in here ever have a discussion with your wife or husband? By, By discussion, I mean the one the neighbors could hear and they could weigh in on the situation. You know, if you needed some advice. They'd be like, yeah, I heard y'all talking about it. I heard y'all discussing that. The other day, Brother West told me the other day that he and Sister Betty have only had one one fight in their 40-some-odd years of marriage. He said it lasted 40-some-odd years, but it's just been one fight. (laughs) Amen? You ever have one of those discussions with your your spouse? Those are hard, ain't they? Because really there's no winners. There's no winners in that. And what happens, you have to walk away, and you get mad, and your wife's telling you, just stop, just stop. And you leave, you slam the door, you go out, and you fume for a little while, and you're... <laughs> and if you're spiritual enough, you'll even attempt to pray. But guess what happens when you attempt to pray? Your spirit won't hardly let you, right? Am I right? You, you, anybody else been there besides me? Okay, just me. But listen, here's what happens. Let me tell you how it works in my life. I walk away fuming, and now my heart, it becomes hard and calloused and... I, I don't even want to pray. You ever been there? Don't even want to pray. Don't want to talk to God because God's going to tell you that you're proud, that your stinking hard heart is proud. So what happens? You cool off. You come to grips with your pride. Say, God, give me strength. Help me go back and make it right. And you walk back in like a whoop dog. And you go back and you say, honey, those famous words, the famous three words, I was wrong. (laughs) I was wrong. Hey, listen, even if you're right, you're still wrong. You can be right and be wrong at the same time. And how I handle things. And boy, isn't that the uh, most bittersweet moment? The grace to go back in and say, I have cast down my pride. It hurts so good, doesn't it? Because it feels good to be brought back into fellowship with God and your wife and your family and everybody else. Boy, but it hurts to strike down that pride, doesn't it? And the truth is, listen, friends, it isn't just the husbands. It's it's pride on both sides. On both sides. It's pride. It divides society. Listen, it it creates racial problems. Pride. 
pride creates racial problems. It's my pride versus your pride. It divides society. It creates national problems, personal problems, marital problems. It is divisive. We must swallow our pride. I went to the ABA meeting, the state meeting on Thursday with Brother West. I was good, it was good to see people swallow their pride. We had a discussion, and there was the old way versus the new way. The moderator got up, the guy that was presenting the, the changes, the proposed changes, he said, on the front of this paper, you're going to see the word changes. So let's go ahead and pray right now that God help us. And there's the old way, and there's the new way. And it's, I want to do it this way, but I want to do it this way. And friends, it was good and refreshing to pe see people take their pride and sit it aside and say, we'll go the way that everybody votes. And we'll love each other. That's putting down your pride. Because, it, listen, it very easily could have divided that congregation. But it didn't. Pride divides society. Number four, how pride is dangerous. Number four, pride dishonors life. Let me read some verses to you quickly. You can jot them down, and I'll read them for you. Proverbs 11, 2. When pride cometh, then cometh shame. This is, this is a paradox because the proud person wants to be exalted and lifted up. But the Bible tells us the proud person will be what? Brought low. He'll be brought low. The Bible tells us that the low person will be what? Exalted. If you will be lifted up, you'll be abased. But if you'll be abased and humble, God will exalt you in due time. It's a paradox. The proud person wants to be exalted, but he says of the proud person, he said, when pride cometh, then cometh shame. The one thing they want is honor, and the one thing they don't get is honor. They get shame. Pride cometh before destruction, and a haughty spirit cometh before a fall, friends. Proverbs 15, 33, the fear of the Lord is the instruction of wisdom, and before honor... Before honor is humility. Now, I told you, humility is not thinking poorly of yourself. It's simply not thinking of yourself. That's humility. No, humility that, well, I'm just not very good. Oh, I just didn't do that. That's not humility. That's called false humility. And it's just as disgusting as pride. Humility is when you simply do not think of yourselves. You esteem others higher than yourself. You think of others before you think of yourself. It's ironic that the one thing the proud person wants is honor, and yet he receives dishonor, shame. Proverbs 18, 12, before destruction, the heart of man is haughty, and before honor is humility. Proverbs 29, 23, a man's pride shall bring him low, but honor shall uphold the humble in spirit. He want, the, the, pride, the prideful man wants honor, yet he's brought low. That's what happened to Satan, wasn't it? You know what happened to him? I will be like the Most High. I will ascend unto the heavens. I will be lifted up high. And he says, yet you shall be brought low. That's how it's always been. There are a lot of paradoxes in God's kingdom. Do you know that? First shall be last. Right? So here's how it works. Pride brings dishonor. To us it dishonors man and boy did it ever bring Lucifer low over and over and over again in the Bible this principle is taught the humble shall be exalted the proud shall be abased pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall you want to be lifted up you want to be you want to be honored be humble be abased. Number five, and lastly, five ways pride destroys lives. Number five, pride destroys souls. Pride destroys souls. I have some other verses I could read. I'll just read one. Proverbs 15, 25 says this. The Lord will destroy the house of the proud. He'll destroy the house of the proud. Listen, friends, pride is the road to ruin. It has led to personal ruin. People's lives have been destroyed. 
because they are too proud to, to change. It has led to national ruin. America is proud. America is proud. America is proud. And, and, and listen, America could be headed for a fall. It's led to domestic ruin, divorce. Dysfunctional families run rampant because of pride. And people won't kill their pride. They just feed it. It's led to emotional ruin. It's led to spiritual ruin. Pride has led to spiritual ruin. God can't use a proud person. Furthermore, God will not use a proud person. He won't. Listen, there are people who are too proud to be used of God, and so they've been placed on the shelf. Listen, friends, you can be too big for God to use, but you can never be too small for God to use. Pride has led to spiritual ruin to many people. Now I want to close with this thought right here. Back in Luke chapter 18, we read the parable, or I paraphrased the parable, the Pharisee and the publican. And basically, we could bring that down to this right here today. Two men went to church today. Brother so-and-so and brother so-and-so. One of them said, the Bible says he stood and prayed with himself. Isn't that an amazing thought? He prayed with himself. That's because God wasn't in his prayer. God, I thank you that I'm not like other men. Boy, look at all the things that I've done. I fast twice in the week. I, I tithe of all that I possess. I pray often. I, Lord, I thank you that I'm not like other men. And then there's the old publican over there beating his breast with his head bowed low. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. The sinner, the chiefest of sinners. The Bible says those two men went home that day. It says of the publican who prayed that way that he went home justified that day. Now today, we're going to go home one of two ways. Are you ready? I'll close with this. Go ahead, Brother Sam, come on up. Sister Sue, I want to close with this thought. We're going to go home today one of two ways. Either today you go home dignified or today you go home justified. Dignified means you leave here today with your pride intact. Dishonored and defiant to God. But listen, you get to keep your, you get to keep your pride and your dignity that says, well, I, I don't need to be saved. I don't need all these things. I, I am good enough. I thank you, God, that I am the way that I am. And you get to go home dignified. But friends, the person who will abase themselves and put themselves at the feet of Jesus and cry out for his mercy will go home today justified before God. You know what that tells me right there? It tells me two things. It tells me, first of all, that, that there's no sinner who's too bad to be saved. And it also tells me that there's no man who's too good that he need not be saved. Now, where are you at today? Are you struggling with your pride? Many of you, I, I have pricked your heart today. The Holy Spirit has pricked your heart. Some of you are here today, and you need to be saved. You need to get on your face before God and cry out in humility, have mercy on me, sinner. Friends, if you do that today, God will honor that prayer. He'll hear from heaven. He'll reach down. With the hand of mercy, he'll pull you up. He'll cover your sin with the blood of Jesus Christ that was shed so many years ago. Today, you can walk out of here justified before God. No longer an old sinner.
not even an old sinner saved by grace, but a new creature in Christ Jesus. Cleansed of all unrighteousness, forgiven, standing in good standing with God in heaven. And if you died this day, after doing that, you can face God. And you can say, cleansed and justified by the blood of Jesus Christ. Friend, don't let your pride keep you out of heaven. Pride has escorted so many people straight to hell. Pride will take you down a road of ruin and it will leave you at hell's gate when it's done. Cut it off. Today, come right now. Right now, get on your face before God and say, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Forgive me. Make me your child. Save me from my sin. Cleanse me from all unrighteousness. He'll do it today. Maybe you're here today and you've been saved for a long time. God cannot use somebody who's full of pride, but he wants to use you. Today you can come and say, I, I'm laying down my pride today. I want to be used of you, God. What will you do today? Will you walk out dignified or justified?